Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, June 23rd. We are in Lesson 4 of Unit 1 for the quarter, for the summer quarter, which is entitled A Fulfilled Covenant. Our unit title is A Fulfilled Covenant. And our lesson text is taken from Colossians chapter 2 verses 1 to 15 hopefully uh, you've read the devotional reading which is taken from first corinthians chapter 3 verses 10 to 17 from the standard commentary our lesson title is hearts united hearts united and our lesson aims or number one, list three things that believers have in Christ. Three things that believers have in Christ. Number two, compare and contrast the meaning and significance of circumcision and baptism. And then number three, identify one area to grow or mature in his or her walk with Christ and make a plan to do so. The standard commentary lesson outline has four major divisions after the introduction. The first is love's concern, that's covered between chapter 2, verses 1 and 5. The second is love's growth, that's covered between verses 6 and 7. The third is love's object, covered between verses 8 and 12. And the fourth is love's triumph. That's covered between verses 13 and 15. From the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, our lesson title is Stronger Together. Stronger Together. And additional aims are, number one, contrast the deceptive philosophies of false teachers with the true faith in which the Colossians had been established. Number two, long to be rooted and built up in Christ and more firmly established in the faith we have received. And then number three, embrace what Paul teaches about our new standing in Christ as a guard against false teaching. The adult quarterly outline, lesson outline has three major divisions. The first is be encouraged. That's covered between chapter 2, verses 1 and 5. The second is Christ, fullness of the deity. That's covered between verses 6 and 12. And then the third is be encouraged. Be encouraged again. And that's covered between verses 13 and 15. Now, in the way of uh, introduction, um, before we read our lesson text, um, the epistle or letter to the church at Colossae uh, was, uh, and actually also uh, this letter <clears throat> went to Laodicea, which was uh, approximately 10 to 11 miles from Colossae, or at least Paul intended for it to be read there as well, was written by Paul around 62 AD and while he was um, in prison at, at Rome for the first time. Uh, and Paul has received encouraging words. We read the first chapter of Colossians uh, <clears throat> from Colossae, uh, but he's also received about their faith and their faith walk, uh, but he's also received some disturbing news about false teachers. Uh, among whom were uh, the Gnostics, and we'll talk a little bit about Gnosticism in a minute, but also Judaizers, and there were other um, false teachers teaching heresies to uh, some in the Colossian church. And of course, some were weak, weaker in the faith, and they were um, believing what these false teachers were 
teaching. So Paul set out in this uh, portion, at least of Colossians, uh, to address uh, the false teachers and to really make a distinction between what they were teaching and the true knowledge and wisdom uh, that comes uh, through our faith in Jesus Christ. And, of course, uh, that uh, what God did to him being a mystery to mankind uh, before his first advent. So Paul, Paul actually ends chapter one talking about this mystery. If I, we back up a little bit to, uh, uh, to verse 27 of chapter one, it reads, to whom God would make known, that is, the riches of his glory of this mystery. Actually, let me back up to 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, or the confident expectation of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in whom uh, in uh, all wisdom, rather, that we may present every man perfect or complete in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. So that passage precedes uh, our lesson text, which begins in the first at the first verse of chapter 2. And let's just read through that lesson text in, in its entirety. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is true wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying in and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men after the rudiment of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and, all, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. And our key verse is verse, actually verses 6 and 7. Uh, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, 
abounding therein with thanksgiving. Now, uh, we're going to get right into the lesson uh, and uh, discuss it verse by verse, and we're going to probably go back and forth between the NIV and the KGV for for greater understanding of, of each verse. Uh, but, again, Paul has spoken about the mystery uh, that had been a mystery for ages, from generations before. This mystery was what God would do uh, in and through Christ Jesus, uh, who would make the full payment for our sin, and in whom we would have fullness. Uh, now, one of the things that the false teachers were teaching, particularly the Gnostics, was that uh, there was a, uh, a separation of body and spirit. Uh, the body was inherently evil and, of course, could do whatever it wanted to do, whatever the flesh wanted to do. But it was distinct from the spirit, which was thought to be pure and enlightened and, uh, of course, uh uh, the had special knowledge. Uh, this word Gnostic comes from to know or knowing. And uh, they denied, of course, that Christ actually came in flesh, uh, but uh, it just appeared to come in flesh. And they believed that uh, his body, um, his spirit actually indwelt the flesh uh, or the appearance of flesh at the baptism and departed before his his death on the cross. So they did not believe in a bodily resurrection of Christ. Uh, and of course, that was a, uh, that was quite a heresy. Uh, Gnosticism uh, was again, uh, uh, allowing uh, the body to do whatever it, it did. And, and some took that to mean that they could indulge the flesh in all kinds of sinful behavior and uh, and it didn't have any uh, effect on their salvation. Uh, others believed that they needed to live an ascetic life, and they, of course, uh, lived very austere and uh, uh, in the flesh. Uh, and then uh, Judaism was the other major heresy that was being taught, and that was uh, some so-called Christian Jews were teaching that in order to uh, receive Christ uh, as Savior, you also had to uh, convert to Judaism and keep all the Mosaic laws, including uh, circumcision. Okay, so those were the two main heresies that were being taught uh, at the church in Colossae. So verse 1 says, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Um, now, the NIV reads, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. Paul has prayed, been praying fervently for them. If you read the first chapter of, Coloss of uh, Colossians, you read about his fervent prayer uh, for them. And, uh, and it is an inspiring prayer. Uh, and of course, again, he's received a word uh, that uh, they, from Epaphras uh, that uh, was encouraging uh, in one respect, because some were uh, uh, steadfast in their faith, but it was discouraging in others because of the false teachers that were threatening uh, to lead so many of them astray. Uh, so this is the conflict that he has. Uh, this, uh, and, and he is contending in prayer for them. And of course, this letter is written to encourage and to instruct them into their standing uh, concerning their standing in Christ. And, of course, he wants this letter to be read at Laodicea, uh, which, is, again, is about 10 or 11 miles away. Uh, he, at this time, has not uh, visited uh, the church at Colossae. Uh, again, he this letter was written from uh, Rome. Uh, he was in prison. Uh, this was his first imprisonment, uh, during, rather, his first imprisonment in Rome. 
Uh, it's believed that he did eventually make it to Colossae during his third missionary journey, but he is writing to all who would hear this who have not met him personally. He has uh, met some of them, uh, Archippus or Chippus. Uh, we read about that in Colossians 4.17. Of course, he's, uh, he's uh, also uh, met uh, Philemon. Uh, and Onesimus, uh, you read about that, of course, in uh, Philemon 1 and 2, and also Colossians 4, 10 to 17, but he has not met uh, the others, apparently. Verse 2a says that their hearts might be comforted. Now, we know the, the heart uh, is referred to often and, and really symbolizes the the center of uh, our emotions, the center of our moral and ethical uh, deliberation and attitudes, uh, and, and, and really sometimes is used synonymously with mind. And he's talking about comforted. And, of course, he's talking about uh, solace, offering some solace to, uh, to those uh, hearts or those minds, and also some encouragement and He's intending to strengthen them. And the, the word uh, here uh, from the Greek translated comforted is the same word, the root word used for Holy Spirit, uh, comforter in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 14, uh, verses 16 and 26. To be being knit together in love. And uh, what he means by that is uh, he's talking about uh, a unity that they share uh, in the agape or the uh, benevolent love of God. Uh, he's, he's, he's addressing them as being united believers, again, in love and in their devotion to Christ. And Christ is the one, of course, who empowers them to love um, you might want to look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, and verse uh, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Uh, we're going to look very briefly at uh, 1 John uh, 4 and 11. And I often uh, <clears throat> tell people that this is, uh, 1 John uh, is really, I think it was written uh, primarily to to teach Christians how they can know uh, for sure whether they are saved or not, whether they they have indeed uh, trusted Christ as Lord and Savior and in, in, or indwelt by Him. So, First John four eleven reads, "Beloved, if God so loved us, we are also to love one another." And let me go on here and, and read twelve and thirteen. It says, "For no man hath seen God at any time." If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us, or is completed in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And that his spirit empowers us, or enables us to love with his love one another. Part C of verse 2. And unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Reading that from the International Version, uh, it reads, uh, the, the, So that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. Christ Jesus, the coming of the Messiah, and, what, and his work was a mystery again that uh, uh, had been uh, for ages and generations before. Let's go on to verse 3. It was, it was a hidden, it was hidden knowledge, but now it's revealed uh, in Christ. Verse 3 in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In whom? The in whom is Christ. In Christ are all the true 
I'll add, true tr- treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, the Judea, the the Gnostics in particular, and there were others that were teaching uh, about uh, higher spiritual planes and under and understanding coming from other spiritual sources. Uh, most likely, they were demonic. Uh, but he is making a distinction here, and he's saying in Christ, and again, emphasis true. I'll say true treasures of wisdom and knowledge were revealed. Uh, now, while related, wisdom and knowledge or have different meanings. Of course, knowledge is, of course, uh, the understanding or apprehension of, of facts and truths. Uh, wisdom is the ability to appropriately use knowledge and facts. Uh, and, of course, true wisdom comes from God. And, of course, uh, we know that uh, there's a distinction between godly wisdom and the wisdom of this world, which is foolishness to God. So what is Paul saying here? He's saying Christ is the source of true wisdom and knowledge, not what these heretics have been teaching you. Let's go on to verse 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Now he's saying that because these... uh, these teachers are smooth talkers. I mean, they're dazzling the audiences and impressing them with their oratory, and 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 they sound like they're speaking the truth. Uh, and so uh, it's it's likely that some that uh, are not uh, firm or steadfast in their faith or uh, believing uh, what they're saying. Uh, the NIV uh, 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 states it this way. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you, that's beguiling, by fine-sounding arguments. Uh, You know, um, some atheists and agnostics can sound intelligent and make arguments that maybe the world uh, would believe, but uh, they are baseless and they're rooted in uh, the understanding uh, and man's understanding or man's knowledge, which is basically nothing compared to the knowledge and wisdom of God. Verse 5. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith. Now, this whole uh, passage here or this section of our lesson through verse 5 is uh, encouragement, is intended to encourage. And of course, Paul is complimenting them on the steadfastness of the faith, at least those who have been steadfast uh, in their faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done. And he is, he's again, um, not present with them, but he is uh, with them in spirit. Uh, he understands the situation. He understands what is going on. And, of course, uh, he is. Uh, uh, the letter is intended to encourage and to warn them and to inform them of what they have in Christ Jesus. You know, one of the things that I think uh, we as Christians ought to be fully aware of is what we have in Christ Jesus, how Christ completes us. And that is one of the things that Paul is attempting to to share here we're not uh of course the flesh uh is not distinct entirely from the spirit we know that uh we our flesh what our flesh does is influenced by the inner person or directed by the inner person of course uh we are uh we sin in thought word and deed and acts of the flesh and when paul talks about their faith in christ he is not just talking about an intellectual assent to truth claims, but he's talking about a commitment to Christ. This is, faith, this is a faith that results in a commitment to one's trust in Christ. Uh, we can read more about that in First Thessalonians 1 and 3, and of course James uh, chapter 2, verses 14 to 22, in which James says, you know, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my work. So 
uh, the outworking of faith is acts or acts or actions uh, or doing something that demonstrates true faith. I'm going to move over to chapter, I'm sorry, verse 6. Uh, and we be- began a, a new division in standard uh, entitled Love's Growth. And from the adult quarterly, the division is fullness of the deity. Uh, and this is covered between verses uh, 6 and 12 in the adult quarterly. So verse 6 reads, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Now, um, first of all, receive. This receive means you have accepted him as Lord and Savior. And because Paul uses his full title here, uh, Christ Jesus the Lord, uh, he's reminding the readers of who he actually is. And um, from the from the from the quarterly, I think the commentator does a really good job of breaking down uh, the full meaning of this full title. Uh, first, he is the Christ or the promised Messiah foretold uh, by the Old Testament prophets, the anointed one of God. Uh, and then second, Jesus is Savior. Jesus is the uh, Greek transliteration of the Hebrew word Joshua or Yeshua, which means Yahweh is salvation or deliverance. And then finally, he is Lord. Lord uh, is the Greek word for or the Greek word rather is Kurion meaning supreme in authority. He is supreme in authority. So all those uh, meanings are uh, involved in his full title, uh, Christ Jesus, the Lord. And when he says, walk in, walk ye in him, what is what does he mean there? Uh, uh, he's talking about uh, in our thoughts and in our deeds, uh, walking, of course, is symbolic of living, uh, and also it's symbolic of taking a journey uh, with a goal uh, in mind. So we're going someplace, and that place is the greater and greater maturity in Christ, but we're walking in obedience uh, and having our minds uh, subject and our bodies, the acts of our bodies and our speech, subject and controlled by the Lord Jesus. So then... As we walk, uh, Paul wants uh, us to be strengthened in Christ. Verse 7 reads, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Let's read that from the NIV. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in faith, as you were taught, and overflowing with thanksgiving. Now, he's borrowing some agricultural terms here. To root something uh, is basically uh, it's symbolic of planting a seed that, evol- that eventually sprouts roots uh, and, of course, uh, produces a plant of some sort that is grounded in soil. And this good soil, but it grows and that's the, this built up uh, concept here in him. We are rooted in the good soil of Jesus Christ uh, and we've been planted like a seed in him and we're established. You can uh, imagine a, uh, a, a tree, maybe a, a cedar or a, a mighty oak uh, being uh, firmly rooted in soil and established and steadfast. He says, as ye have been taught. So they have been taught. Uh, how uh, to to live uh, for Christ, and now he is reminding them to do that, and he says, abounding therein with thanksgiving. We're to thank God. We're to give God thanks because 
we have such, uh, because we have everything that we need in Christ. We're to be thankful for that, that he's made every provision for our grounding and our growth in him. Verse 8, beware lest any, and now we're beginning a new division in uh, the standard, which is love's object, love's object. And he says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Let's look at that from the NIV. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of the world rather than on Christ. So he is warning. This is a warning uh, to guard their minds uh, to not accept or believe these vain philosophies philosophy of course refers to uh, wisdom or comes from the word sophia which means wisdom but it but is it has a human origin It's based on human understanding and of course the, the word rudiments used in the king james uh, means elemental or fundamental uh, spiritual forces uh, as is it's translated in the NIV of the world. These are not uh, basically rooted in in God or the wisdom that he provides or knowledge he provides, but this is based on human understanding and not after Christ. So the uh, all as, as, as you may know, all the false gods of antiquity of ancient times, uh, were pure, uh, purely manufactured uh, in, God, in, the, in, the, in the minds of men. Uh, they made them in their own image. They made them capricious. They made them uh, vengeful. They made them selfish. They made them lustful. They made them. Uh, they, they reflected all the characteristics of man because they came out of man's mind and man's heart, uh, based on man's understanding, not from God. So, again, he's warning them not to uh, to guard their minds against this uh, this vainness, this emptiness, this deceit uh, and uh, and not follow them uh, because uh, and to follow uh, Christ and said they're teaching rather something that uh, is of the, uh, has its origin in the world and not in Christ. Let's move on to verses nine and ten. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and power. Now, why does Paul uh, make a point of saying that in Christ, all the fullness of deity, the Godhead, that's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the full deity live in bodily form. Well, it is because, again, the Gnostics were teaching that Christ did not actually come in the flesh, that it was just apparent. It was it just appeared that he did. And, of course, the, uh, uh, the body that appeared to be flesh uh, was in, uh, that he did not, uh, he departed, his spirit departed that, before it was actually crucified. And of course, they believe that he indwelt uh, that apparent body at his baptism. Uh, and, and, and that was one of the things that Paul emphasized in, uh, in other places in, the, uh, in his epistles, that the bodily resurrection of Christ was important for believers to Understand that God himself came in bodily form to die, to bear our sins, to suffer the pain and the agony of the cross and to bear our sins on the cross, to shed his blood for our sins. And that's a vital point in, in the fundamentals of our faith. And what Paul is saying is he is, uh, he says we are complete in him. We're not, again, there's not this schism 
between uh, our flesh and our spirit, uh, we have a completeness, wholeness in Christ Jesus. Uh, we are body, uh, 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 mind, and spirit, and we are uh, triune in, in that respect, and we are complete, the spiritual component is alive because of our rebirth and we are complete in Christ and we're complete as far as all of our uh, sufficient our needs for sufficiency in terms of wisdom and knowledge as well he says he is the head of all principalities and powers so while the the Gnostics and other heretics were teaching that they had some special knowledge that came from some some other spiritual plane some higher spiritual plane Paul is uh, professing here that Christ is the head of all principalities and powers. There are no principalities and powers anywhere that Paul, that Christ is not the head of or the Lord of, supreme authority of. Now, you know, what the, the Judaizers taught, on the other hand, was that Christ was not sufficient that uh, not only uh, did believers have to trust Christ or believe him, but they also had to convert to Judaism. And, and this church at Colossae was was primarily Gentiles, okay? Uh, not only did they have to convert to Judaism, which involved uh, uh, keeping, but they had to keep the Mosaic law, which involved uh, circumcision. So they were teaching that the males had to be circumcised in order to, to really be saved. Well, there was, so in other words, Christ was just something that they were adding to their old uh, tradition of trying to be saved through the keeping of the law. And that is what Paul is, 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 uh, is trying to teach against here. And this next uh, few verses is going to uh, make that uh, clear. There was, and we, we should know that nothing, uh, uh, Christ plus nothing is needed Christ our faith in Christ and nothing else is is needed and there are uh, isms in the world today that teach that uh, yeah uh, you can be saved through Christ but you got to have this also uh, I'm not going to name any today but you know some of them they knock on your doors on Saturday morning sometimes verse 11 in whom ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of sins of the sins rather of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now what what was circumcision all about? And why did God command that the children the male children of Israel be circumcised? Well, it was a token, it was a sign of a covenant relationship with God and his people, Israel, the descendants of Israel, uh, and uh, nothing more. I mean, it was a sign that they were descendants of Abraham, and they were his covenant, his chosen people. Of course, he delivered his laws, his oracles, uh, through uh, the Israelites, and through them he brought the Messiah into the world, and Fulfillment of the promise to Abraham through his seed to bless all the nations of the of the world, uh, but uh, there is what what he but that circumcision never saved. He's speaking of he's addressing what the Judaizers are teaching now. The circumcision never saved; it was a sign. And now he's saying there is another circumcision uh, or token or sign that uh, we have received from Christ, and this sign was not uh, uh, given uh, by with hands or made with hands and 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 of course God never intended for the circumcision of the flesh to be just uh, a a sign but he intended for it to be one of the heart as well even when it was um, commanded originally if we go back to well, actually, we can go back to uh, Genesis chapter 17 and we can see where it was first commanded. But if we go to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 10 and verse 16 and then 30 and 6, let's take a look at those real quick. So in uh, Deuteronomy 10, 16, 
God says, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff necked. So it was intended to be a condition to reflect the condition of their heart toward God and not just an outward meaning or sign uh, that that they uh, somehow were uh, uh, inheritors of a special grace because of uh, this covenant relationship through Abraham with God. Let's move into our last segment, which uh, from the standard is entitled Love's Triumph, and from the quarterly is entitled Be Encouraged. They're being be encouraged again, and this is verses 13 to 15. Verse 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven your trespasses. From the NIV, it reads, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all your sins. Because of our sins, we were spiritually dead. Uh, actually, as you, as you know, uh, because of the sin of our progenitor, Adam, Death, a sin passed on, a sin nature passed on to all of his descendants, and we were dead spiritually from the time Adam sinned. Uh, and so we were dead in trespasses and sin, and of course, the, the, uh, those uh, words uh, are similar, but it, they basically mean a willful, a deliberate uh, disobedience uh, and unfaithfulness to God. Uh, this isn't something that uh, this isn't talking about an occasional stumbling, but it's talking about a willful, deliberate disobedience and unfaithfulness to God. And he says, uh, God has forgiven that. He has for he has forgiven that. Uh, let's go on to verse 14, and he says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. That was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Let's read that from the NIV. It says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, I'm sorry, uh, having canceled, rather, the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Now, he is speaking of this, this handwriting of ordinance is speaking of the law, the Old Testament law. And we can think of the Old Testament law as a, as a debt or an invoice or an IOU that indicates what we owe to God, something that we owe to God. And, of course, we know that the ancient Jews uh, thought that they could uh, uh, they could. Uh, be saved by keeping the law. And of course, no one could keep the law perfectly, nor was it intended to be a means of salvation. And Paul says it's good and it was holy and good in Romans seven twelve, but it was not intended again to, to be a means of salvation. It was to show us God's righteous standards and it was to accuse uh, the Israelites and, and to, accuse, it's to accuse all of us of our sins. Uh, we know that we've sinned because of God's law, and we know when and how we sin because of God's law. So this, uh, the law was looked at as a debt to be paid, uh, and what Christ did or what God did through Christ was cancel that debt, nailing it, he says, to the cross. Now, it was the custom uh, of, of Rome and, and perhaps the Persians who... 
uh, supposedly invented uh, crucifixion to uh, nail the crimes uh, or the accusations of the criminals uh, up above them on the cross. So in other words, they were indicating to all the onlookers why this person was being punished or the debt that they were paying for with their lives uh, above them on the cross. The thieves no doubt had uh, some nailings over them that were crucified with Christ. And of course, above Christ, uh, we know Pilate had king of the Jews. And of course, that was considered to be uh, treason in that uh, he was uh, he had made himself a king and not a, a, a acknowledged uh, uh, Caesar as the potentate. Uh, so uh, what what this symbolized is what this verse is saying is that not only was the debt canceled, uh, it was nailed to the cross and the payment for the debt that we could not keep, we could not repay, was paid with his life, with his very life on the cross. Hopefully that's clear. And then finally, verse uh, 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, who did Christ spoil? Who did he triumph over? He spoiled demonic, uh, demonic powers and principalities in the world. When he sacrificed his life, he triumphed over Satan and his demonic forces, and all the powers of evil. Uh, his death stripped the power from him, and of course it paid the penalty for our sins. So we no longer have to fear death because we have eternal life. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we have eternal life from that moment. We don't have to fear eternal separation from God because of death or through death. And now he is like the victorious uh, generals of Rome. I happened to be watching uh, uh, some docudramas on Netflix called The Roman Empire, which are really educational, and they're talking about the various emperors and how they expanded the empire and so forth, but it seems like many of the, the emperors uh, became, uh, were first generals, uh, mighty generals, and they uh, really uh, uh, were exalted uh, through their various conquests of these lands and these territories. And there was customary for them to parade uh, spoils of their victory into Rome or to, uh, in close proximity, uh, slaves and treasures and so forth. And, of course, this is symbolic of what uh, Jesus is doing. He's, he's triumphed over Satan. And, of course, he is uh, making a open he's 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 making an open uh, declaration again of this victory or the niv says uh, he's made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross in his death he was glorified and he made a public spectacle of the powers the demonic and sinful uh, evil powers in the world so um in, in summary, and I, I would just like to read the the conclusion of the uh, from the standard here. Um, he says, uh, first of all, it's entitled "Possession of Completeness." Possession of completeness. We really need to know how complete we are in Christ. Uh, if we lack wisdom, I mean true wisdom, godly wisdom, uh, we need to go to God as our source. Uh, we don't need to. Uh, uh, to pay attention to the wisdom of this world when we have the source of true wisdom and knowledge, and that is understanding, true understanding, and the wisdom, of course, that guides us in how to use that understanding. All right, okay. So he says, because Christ is supreme above all, and we are complete in him, we have all we need. We have everything that we need. We don't need to hear from heretics or vain philosophers. Uh, that's my addition there. Rather than being led astray by other teachings, we trustingly keep our feet on the path Jesus sets for us to walk. And that is my prayer for you and for all, that we will keep our feet steadfast on the path that Jesus has set before us and to rest in him, to recognize that we are complete in him and to walk in him is my prayer.
May God richly bless you and keep you.